So today I wanted to talk about yet, um, well, maybe one last case study of on data analysis, um, which is in trying to dissect and find map trans EQTL hotspots. So which, what that means I'll explain momentarily. Um, but as you recall, that is a main topic of my research has been to try to identify um, the genes that are contributing to quantitative trait variation in experimental crosses, where we do a cross between a couple of strains, and then, and you know, in the the offspring we um, measure genotype across the genome and some out some quantitative trait like blood pressure or insulin level and then we scan across the genome and we look for regions where there's a strong association between genotype and the, the phenotypic outcome um, which um, shows up as if you were to split the mice according to their genotype at that location you'd see a, you know some big difference in the the quantitative trait it, across those three groups um, and ultimately we we try to narrow this region to as small as possible to get to individual genes and that's really where uh, what has been the biggest disappointment in these kinds of efforts is that the regions to which we can map these effects are quite broad with lots of genes getting to the individual gene and really learning about the biology underlying these loci is time consuming um, and um, not always a, a, we don't always get a positive result where we really figure out what the gene is one of the ways to try to get at the underlying genes is to to look at more intermediate sort of biochemical level traits. We're thinking about the, the DNA differences that we're looking for. Um, the sort of central dogma, as they call it, of molecular biology is that DNA gets transcribed, or the, the gene segments in the DNA get transcribed into RNA, which goes out of the cell nucleus, gets translated into proteins, and proteins are actually doing the work. And you know, downstream from those proteins is the clinical trait, you know, insulin level or blood pressure that we're interested in. So we're trying to make a connection between this DNA and this clinical outcome. Um, one way to shortcut that process is to look at measurements of RNA or protein sort um, at, at a you know, that are closer to the DNA differences that we're looking for. It turns out that measuring RNA levels of genes is easier than measuring protein levels of genes. And so much of the focus had been on measuring RNA. Improvements in measuring protein levels have, have really um, improved. <laughs> Improvements have, well, the measurements of proteins has really gotten better, and so there's a lot of interest in measuring proteins now. But um, what I'm going to talk to you today is about looking at RNA levels of genes um, that sit in between the DNA differences we're looking for and the local outcomes that we care about. Um, so the classically, I guess, meaning. 20 years ago, the way that gene expression or the, the RNA levels of genes was measured were with these microarrays that you would put, um, you could, well, you would, you would put samples onto these arrays and get measurements of all 30,000 genes at once. And the, the, so in addition to measuring genotype of a, 500 or so animals and quantitative outcomes like insulin level or body weight or blood pressure we would measure in addition the mrna level of every gene in the genome the the simplest analysis of this sort of data is to um, consider each gene one at a time 
and scan across the genome and look for regions of the genome where genotype is associated with the level of RNA of a particular gene. And that um, do that for each of the 30,000 genes. And then this is a plot that shows um, on the y-axis the position of a gene that we're studying, and on the x-axis the um, position of QTL or the you know the genotype information. The each dot here is saying that a gene at that location, say on chromosome two, its mRNA level is associated with genotype at that position on chromosome five. So the so for each of 30,000 genes across the genome, we did a scan across the genome to look for regions of the genome where that gene's expression, its RNA level, is associated with genotype. And each dot is saying a gene at that position is associated with genotype at this other position. The main features in these results are this, you know, strong diagonal where um, the, the level of mRNA of a gene is strongly associated with genotype at the same position. So, you know, genes, um, their, their RNA seems to be controlled by genotype differences right next to them. And then the second major feature are these vertical bands where for example, this band on, chromos the, on chromosome six, there's something at the end of chromosome six that seems to be affecting the mRNA level of genes all over the genome. We also see a band on chromosome two here, um, 19, 17, 13, maybe 12. So there are spots across the genome where the genotype at that location seems to be af affecting the, the expression of genes, the RNA levels of genes that are all over the genome. So again, the y-axis here is the location of a gene whose RNA level I'm treating as a quantitative trait. The x-axis is the, you know, I'm doing this genome scan to try to find locations where genotype is affecting that gene's expression. We see this major band along the, or this, this strong diagonal where the, the RNA level of a gene is affected by genotype right next to it, but then also these vertical bands where there's some spot in the genome that seems to be affecting the expression of genes all over. There's some spot, say on chromosome six or on chromosome two, that's affecting genes throughout the genome. This particular plot is from this, um, the crop you looked at in the homework three. So about 550 mice from an intercross between two strains. Um, and they looked, they measured gene expression, not just in this one tissue, which are islets of the pancreas, but they looked at six different tissues so that islet that we that I just showed, also adipose, um, muscle, hypothalamus, kidney, liver. All of them you see these strong diagonal lines where the, ex, um, the expression of a gene is strongly affected by genotype at the same location um, and, and vertical lines in different locations um, where you know, a gene on chromosome 10 seems to be affecting gene expression of lots of different genes in adipose. Some of these vertical lines are seen in a lot of different tissues, like chromosome 17, there's a vertical line there in, in each of the six, well, in five out of the six tissues, there's not as much going on in hypothalamus for a variety of reasons that I think are mostly about the quality of the data for hypothalamus. 
So there are some of these vertical bands that are common across all six tissues. And there's some vertical bands like this one on chromosome six that are very specific to one tissue. So there's something on chromosome six that's affecting the level of mRNA of lots of genes, like 8% of genes in the genome. And it's very specific to, to islets in the, in the pancreas. Um, so what I'm interested in today is in trying to understand these vertical bands um, so that the, you know, locations in the genome that are affecting the expression of genes are called eQTL or QTL that affect the expression of a gene. And the, the, these, um, QTL that are sort of affecting genes off the diagonal, they're called trans-EQTL, trans for distant. So where the, uh, you know, the, the EQTL that's affecting a gene's expression is on some other chromosome from where the gene itself is sitting. And these regions that affect the expression of lots of different genes have been called hotspots, trans-EQTL hotspots. I'm interested in primarily in two questions. One is, if I look at one of these hotspots, can I narrow in on the causal gene that's contributing to, that's causing that effect? And secondly, can I tell if it's really one thing there or multiple things? Um, if, you, if you look in particular, this chromosome six band in islet is, seems like a, much more precise line than the chromosome two band in islet. Chromosome two seems to be more of a smear. Is that because it's more complicated that there are multiple things at that location? So those are the two questions I'm trying to answer. So I'm going to start by focusing just on this chromosome six locus, which is interesting because it is very specific to islet and it affects lots and lots of genes in these pancreatic islet clusters of cells. Um, so in each of these plots, I'm looking at um, position on chromosome six, and then each dot is um, the, the maximum association between a gene and, and um, the gene's expression and genotype along chromosome six. And the blue dots are for genes that sit somewhere else in the genome. And the brown dots are for genes that are sitting on chromosome six. So, for each gene, for each gene in the genome, I plot the maximum association between that gene's expression and the as a the you know strength of association between that gene's expression and genotype. I plot the strength of that association versus the the estimated location of the the spot that's having the effect. And I've thresholded this at five or something. So all the stuff that's not really showing an association with genotype on this chromosome, I'm throwing out. Um, I think the key thing here is that on chromosome six, we have this very, we have a ton of dots that are all sort of piling up at around 92, 95 um, centimorgans on chromosome six. And it's very specific to these, to this one tissue. It's not seen at all in these other tissues. So I want to know what is it at that location that is affecting expression of lots of genes. And the, the way that I did this was to, to try to narrow in on the causal effect, the, the causal locus was with really one sort of main trick. So um, 
you know, the 500 mice where I have genotype across this, across the genome and then the expression of genes. Um, you know, they're these intercross mice that are, have at any one location, they have one and three possible genotypes. They're either homozygous for one parent, they're homozygous for the other parent, or they're heterozygous. My first main, well, the, I mean, the, the, the main idea I had is, so I have this region on chromosome six that looks to be affecting expression of lots of genes. I'm first going to just focus on the mice that um, have kind of constant genotype across that whole larger region on chromosome six. So out of the 500 mice, I'm going to pull out, say, 350 or so mice where they have really no change across this region. So imagining that there's a single locus in this region that's affecting expression of lots of genes, these mice, I really know what their genotype is at that causal locus. And then having done that, I'll, you know, so I'm going to ignore initially all these recombinant mice that um, where they had an exchange from say being homozygous pink to being heterozygous or being homozygous blue to being heterozygous across this region. So I'm just going to focus on these first three categories of individuals and um, I'm going to look at their traits. So if I pull out those mice and I look at, so let's say I take the top 100 or so genes, you know, whose expression is strongly associated with genotype in this region. If I take those top genes and I plot the first principal component against the second principal component, it splits up into three really clear groups. And if we color the, so each dot here is a mouse, the principal components are really finding linear combinations of the genes expression that would be most variable. The first principal component really splits the three groups apart and the second principal component really separates the two homozygotes from the heterozygotes. If you color the mice by their genotype, it makes really clear that we have three gene the, the three groups that we're seeing in this plot of the first and the second principal component are the three genotypes at this locus. So that so I'm interested in trying to identify the causal gene underneath this locus that seems to affect lots of genes. I start by just focusing on the mice that have kind of constant genotype across that region. If I plot the the first and second principal components as a scatter plot, the mice um, cluster into three clear groups, and those three groups turn out to be genotype in that region. If I now overlay all the other mice onto this plot, mice that didn't have constant genotype across the region, all the other mice fit perfectly into those three clusters which suggests that um, we then know the genotype of those mice at the causal locus. So going back again, so I have 500 mice that um, you know, have varying genotype across this region. I look at the ones the focus on the 300 or so mice that have did not have any kind of exchange. I plot, I calculate the principal components of the sort of top genes, of, you know, associating with this region, and the mice split up into these three clear clusters. If I then overlay all the mice that had a change in genotype across this region, I can clearly see. Um, they fall into one of the three clusters. And from that, I can infer what their genotype as the causal locus must have been. If I, if I, um, in this figure then, I've pulled out the um, 100 or so mice that had an exchange in this region around the 
the QTL. So each vertical line here is one mouse. And the, the genotypes are colored. Um, well, one of the homozygotes in green, the other homozygotes in purple, and I think the heterozygote in orange. So, you know, these mice switch from being purple to being orange. These mice switch from being green to being orange, and so forth. Um, so the, the diamonds along here are what I'd inferred the mouse's QTL genotype to be, so sort of based on that figure of the principal components. And the, that inferred genotype at the causal locus makes it so that it fits perfectly between these two markers, one at 141 megabases and one at 144 megabases or 141 and a half to 145. Um, so th these are all the mice that show a change in genotype across the region. And I use this principal component analysis with the, not, the mice that didn't change, allowed me to infer genotype of the mice that did show a change. And that allows me to narrow the location of this of this causal locus to the, the between these two markers. Most important for this are these the mice that are highlighted in this box that are showing an exchange from say heterozygous to homozygous purple or from homozygous green to heterozygous right in this region of this locus. So I've narrowed the, the, the gene to this um, three and a half million base pair region by, by doing this. And I've, I've identified a set of um, I don't know, 25 or so mice that um, really they're, they're defining the, the they, they, I could use them to help define the, the, that region. So what we then did was took those 25 mice and added a few additional markers into that region around the, into the region between these two um, these these two markers. We added a few more markers, and that allowed me um, narrow it from instead of being 141.5 to 144.9 we have it down now to 141.5 to 142.4 so that the genotype of these mice at the causal locus i've inferred from their expression pattern in the you know as um, displayed in that principal component analysis and by adding additional markers to genotype in this region, I'm able to narrow the narrow the location more precisely to this, you know, slightly less than a million base pairs. And really, and these um, eight mice here are the ones that are showing a recombination event in this smaller interval. So I could further pull out those eight mice and add yet more markers into this region and to narrow the location of where their exchanges occurred. And that allows me to get down to um, that the, the QTL has to sit between where this recombination event happened and where this exchange happened. I, the inferred genotype of each mouse's, each mouse at the causal locus is consistent with the causal gene sitting between this spot here at 141.9 and this spot here that's a little bit above 142.3. Um, and that, that region contains just three genes. And And it, it, it 
the IAPP gene was what was really interesting to me because I stands for islet. It's some sort of islet something, something, something. Um, but my biological collaborators were instead interested in these other two genes and particularly this gene, which is some sort of transporter. And further experiments suggest that, that this gene is actually the causal one. Um, but this um, was sort of a lucky way to find map this this trans EQTL band, and it you know going back, the this the approach was. Um, you know, if we if we focus on the mice that have constant genotype across the region, um, you know, assuming that there is a sort of a single causal locus that that is affecting the expression of a whole bunch of genes, we can use this group of mice to define the genotype and expression pattern association. And it turned out to be rather simple that if we use those mice. We can calculate the first and second principal components, and they the mice fall out into these three distinct clusters. And if we overlay the mice whose genotype changed across that region, they fall perfectly into those clusters. And so we've taken this um, complicated quantitative trait of ex the expression of you know thousand genes and turned it into something that's really, you know, a three class trait. And then we did what's really sort of old school genetics to try to narrow the, you know, successively narrow the region till we get down to a, a point. Um, the, the region, the smallest region where genotype of all the mice in the region is com is consistent with the inferred genotype at the causal locus. That region contained just three genes, and studying those three genes, um, it looked like this SLOCA 1A6 um, is pretty good evidence that it is responsible for this huge expression change in these mice. So that, I mean, so that particular um, trans band, trans EQTL hotspot, or, or locus that affects the expression of lots of different genes across the genome, it um, fit quite clearly a single locus model that there was one thing at that location that was affecting all that, that was affecting expression of lots of genes. And we were able to find map that to this really small region that had just three genes in it. Um, more broadly, you could start with the question of, can you tell that it's a single, that there's a single thing there and not multiple? So I want to look at some of the other genes and, at, and I have a couple different strategies that I use to try to determine was a locus due to a single gene or was, could it be multiple genes underneath? The, the first approach was to look at the effect of the QTL. Um, so I take a locus and I look at what effect does it seem to show on the outcome of, you know, for a given gene, given genes expression, I can look at the average of the, of the two homozygotes, sort of half the difference between the two homozygotes, I call that the additive effect of the locus. And then I look at the relative location of the heterozygotes mean between the two homozygotes, how far the heterozygote is from the midpoint. It's called the, the dominance effect of the locus. So um, if the two homozygotes have really different expression values, then this additive effect will be really large. It, um, Large positive mean, will mean that the R allele has a larger expression value than the B allele. 
Um, large negative will be that those things are swapped. And then this dominance effect is where does the heterozygote sit on the spectrum between the two homozygotes? If it's exactly in the middle, then we'll say the dominance effect is zero. If it's um, sitting on top of RR, it'll, the dominance effect will be equal to A. If it's sitting on top of BB, the dominance effect will be equal to minus A. And it, it could also be outside of the range, it could be um, bigger than A or less than minus A, but very often it's sitting sort of um, somewhere in between here. So um, if I take this chromosome six locus and I look, I can look, I look at two things. One, I look at the, for each gene that's showing association with genotype on this region on chromosome six, I plot the strength of the association and I um, give it a plus sign and put it on this side if the R allele has higher expression than the B allele, and I give it a minus sign and put it down here in blue if the if the B allele is bigger than the R allele. And then here I'm plotting the on the y-axis is the the estimated additive effect. No, I'm sorry. On the on the x-axis it's the estimated additive effect. And on the y-axis is the estimated dominance effect. So at this locus, um, you know, that you know seems like about an equal number of genes that are having the the R allele is has higher expression and that has the B allele has higher expression. Um, but they're all pretty much sandwiched or you know squashed along the x axis or the x axis here meaning that they have varying additive effects but they all pretty they all have pretty small dominance effect looking back at that picture it's basically for most of these genes the average expression value for the heterozygote is pretty close to halfway between the two homozygotes so uh, so this kind of it could say consistent with there being a single thing. Um, it's sort of interesting that the that about half as many genes kind of the R allele caused an increase in expression and about half as many genes the B allele caused an increase in expression. Um, but they all pretty they all look kind of similar otherwise. If we instead look at um, a different one of these transbands, one that affects kidney and is sitting on chromosome 13. Here, it's positioned along chromosome 13, and I'm plotting again. Um, for each gene whose expression is associated with, uh, whose expression in kidney is associated with genotype in this region on chromosome 13, I plot the test statistic versus estimated location. And what I see here is that um, the, you know, there are a bunch of genes that are mapping to around 57 centimorgans and a bunch of genes that are mapping to around 67 centimorgans. The ones mapping over here, it seems like the B allele is increasing genotype, I mean, increasing expression. And the ones mapping over here, mostly the R allele is increasing expression, although there are some down here as well. And then when I when I plot um, the additive effect against the dominance effect, we find turns out that these genes here at around 67 centimorgans, they're the ones on this diagonal. So the dominance effect tends to be equal to the additive effect, um, whereas the genes over here they turn out to be these ones where the, um, and in this case, the, the dominance effect is a little bit less than, well, than the, well, it's a little bit more than the negative of the additive effect. 
So these genes, it looks like R is, you know, is well, the, the heterozygote is sitting on top of the homozygous R. And these genes, the heterozygote is sitting close to the homozygous B. Um, the fact that we have sort of the, the expression traits are clustering in two different locations. And those locations are showing kind of distinct patterns of effect that suggests to me that there's more than one thing here. It's just, it's not just one locus that's affecting expression of kidney, but it's a, a locus here and a second locus here. These are pretty far apart. And so um, I'm not, it's not really a big leap or really that big of a surprise that there seem to be two things happening. Um, here's a, a second situation, um, well, I guess a third one. So again, looking at islet expression, but here looking at this locus on chromosome two, um, we have it, expression traits mapping all over this region from around 55 to around 75, some up here past 85. Um, they all look to be kind of additive effects that, I mean, that, you know, some of them have negative association, some of them have positive association, but the, the dominance effects are, tend to be pretty small. Um, but it seems like a mushy blob. It's not really obvious from this that, I mean, I, I guess I'd be inclined to think that there seems to be a locus here and there seems to be a second locus over here, but it's maybe not totally obvious that these are clustering into two spots the same way. Here's another locus for um, liver expression on chromosome 17. Um, we got genes mapping from around 10 centimorgans to around 20 centimorgans. They all seem to show the same kind of pattern of, um, kind of the dominance effect is about equal to the negative of the additive effect. Um, it's not really obvious that they're clustering in two ways in this case. And here's one more for adipose tissue, chromosome 10. Um, not as many things happening here, but got mostly the genes are piling up at around um, 48 centimorgans and they're mostly looking kind of the same um, not really too obvious clusters going back um, looking at the pattern of effect looking at the the direction of the effect um, this kidney chromosome 13, that pattern seems like really strongly to show there's a there's one thing here and there's another thing here. The the other main trans bands that I have like this, they um, the particular demonstration doesn't seem all that useful. And that I guess you know sort of my experience with genomics. Um, and this kind of, I guess, genetical genomics, expression genetics, is that um, each idea I come up with works some of the time and doesn't work other times, and really no one thing ever works all the time. So you got to try different approaches. So my second approach to try to understand whether there's one or two causal things underneath one of these transbands is to compare the recombinants and the non-recombinants in sort of the way that I use to fine map that initial locus. You know, so here's this islet chromosome six. Um, you know, take the mice that that show no change in genotype across the region and either apply principal component analysis 
for them, their, the expression of genes that map to that region using the non-recombinants, the mice that have constant genotype across the QTL region, apply principal components analysis or um, use linear discriminant analysis to um, the, the difference between these approaches, principal component analysis is just look for linear combinations of the genes where um, that are most variable. Linear discriminant analysis is basically look for linear combinations of the genes that best discriminate among the three genotypes. For this particular locus on chromosome six, they give pretty similar results. But the key thing here um, you'll see in a moment that um, linear discriminant analysis works better for this idea. Principal components analysis was the first idea I had to use here, but it, it turns out that linear discriminant analysis will end up working better. But the the So the idea is, so I have this region of the, of the chromosome that's affecting gene expression, a lot of genes expression. And I take the mice that have constant genotype across that region, and I use them basically to create a classifier of relating genotype at that region to this gene expression pattern. And then I overlay onto those mice the recombinant ones. And if there's a single, thing affecting gene expression, if there's a single thing in that region that's affecting this gene expression pattern, then this is the kind of result that I should expect, that the recombinant mice will look just like um, the non-recombinant mice. The mice that had an exchange will fit exactly into these three clusters. There should be just three clusters of mice according to the genotype of this causal locus. I can find the relationship between the, the genotype and the expression out, outcome using linear discriminant analysis. And then um, when I overlay the recombinants, they should fit exactly into one of those three clusters. You know, um, islet chromosome two. So here again, I take this region on chromosome two that seems to be affecting expression of a lot of genes in islets. I pull out the mice that have kind of constant genotype across that region. And I can do linear discriminant analysis to um, find linear combinations of the genes expression that best separates these three genotype groups. And then I'm, I do that using just these, the mice that have constant genotype. And then I overlay on top of them all the other mice, the mice that had an exchange in genotype. If there's a single causal locus here, all these other mice should fit into those three clusters. And but here you can see that the the yellow sort of the mice that showed a change in genotype, they're kind of all over the place. They're not fitting into those three clusters. And that suggests that um, you know those mice are somehow different than than the the mice with constant genotype, which says that um, there's more than just one gene in the region. So linear discriminant analysis, I use genotype of the of these um, the mice with constant genotype. I use their genotype to do the separation, and it does a much better job of separating the three groups than principal component analysis. Um, Principal component analysis worked really well on that chromosome six locus, but it will find it doesn't actually work well in any other of these cases. Um, so here for kidney on chromosome 13, I um, use linear discriminant analysis to try to separate the three genotype groups and then overlay the recombinants over there. Um, I would say that the, the three groups didn't get separated all that well. And so it's kind of hard to tell whether the recombinants are really kind of fitting within the pattern or not. Um, 
tend to be more of these recombinants kind of in the outlying regions than than would be chance, but I would say that it doesn't um, it's not super compelling. For liver chromosome 17, again, the the purple, orange, and green, so I they I'm using genotype of mice that had constant genotype across the region using linear discriminant analysis to try to separate those three groups, overlaying the recombinants on top of that. And again, I, I think here we have pretty good separation among the three groups and these recombinants, the yellow dots, tend to be outside of those groups. And that suggests again to me that this locus is not just a single thing, but is um, there are multiple things in that region that are affecting the the expression traits. Um, again, adipose chromosome 10. So this region on chromosome 10 affects gene expression of many genes in adipose. Um, I take the mice that had constant genotype across the region. I use linear discriminant analysis to separate the three groups. And then I overlay the recombinants on top of that. And this is, again, you have groups of recombinants that are really quite far outside of the, uh, the main non-recombinant groups. So this, again, looks like um, there looks to be more than one thing in the region that's affecting expression. In all of these case, in all of the cases except the first one, the principal component analysis, where I'm just sort of blindly looking for linear combinations of expression that are very are variable, um, PCA um, does separate mice, and you can kind of hear it sort of separating one of the homozygotes from um, the heterozygotes from the other homozygote, but it seems to be separating something else too. Um, LDA I, is can view it as more directed, works better in this case. Um, you know, I'm, I'm asking um, find combinations of the gene expression that separate these three groups that I know um, works much better. Um, so I'd say, I mean, so this technique seems to be pretty compelling in showing that for, for this locus um, and this one, not so much this one, but also this one, we have a few loci where it's then clear, I think, that there's more than one thing going on in the region that's affecting expression. Um, the nature of that, um, the, the nature of those loci is not so clear by this approach, but um, sort of a, a nice trick that is probably very specific to this particular problem, and you won't learn very much generally about it, but um, it was a, a nifty trick for trying to say, does there look to be one or multiple things affecting expression? The, the last approach that I took was to, to contrive a formal test for is there one or two loci in a region that are, affect, that are affecting expression? But I focus on, um, focus on some set of traits that are mapping to a common region. And I want to fit a multivariate analysis um, that is explicitly, you know, one locus affecting all the traits or two loci. Um, in this case, with the two, two locus model, each trait is affected by either one of the QTL or the other, not by both. So I have sort of a left QTL and a right QTL. Some of the traits are affected by the left QTL and other traits are affected by the right QTL. And the main challenge I have here is that 
um, you know, if I pick, say, the top 50 traits, um, this allocation of which 50 go with the left QTL and which 50 go with the right QTL is, um, I, I need to specify which traits are affected by which one. But there are two to the two to the 50 possible ways of allocating traits to the two QTL. And that's more than I would want to like really consider. So instead the approach that we we took was to order the traits by where their estimated location of the QTL is when considered individually, and then split that list at different points and say um, the ones to the right are affected by one QTL, the ones to the left are affected by the other QTL. And rather than think about two to the 50 possible ways of allocating the traits to the two loci, I just think of 50 ways of allocating the traits to the two loci that are these cut points on this list. So I explicitly, so I consider a model where all the traits are affected by a common locus. And then I also consider a model where I have two loci. I explicitly vary the locations of those two loci. And I explicitly consider um, each trait is affected by either one and locus or the other locus. And I exhaustively study them, um, not exa exhaustively. I consider only, um, I do this approximation where I say, um, instead of looking at all two to the 50 possible models, I look at just 50 of them. And the, the outcome of this analysis um, looks like this. So the black is kind of complicated, but the, so here I'm looking at the, the locus on chromosome 13 and its effect on expression in kidney. The black curve is if I imagine a single locus affecting all the traits, it is kind of a profile of my estimated location of that one locus. Whereas the, the blue and the pink curves are, it are the pro for the, the two locus model where I have one locus that's affecting some portion of the traits and another locus that's affecting the other portion of the traits. Um, and this, the, the blue and the pink ones are for the best split of the 50 traits into two groups. And it's saying um, the, the, the right locus looks to map to around, you know, 68 centimorgans and the left locus looks to map around 55 centimorgans. And the, the dots down here are the, um, the estimated locations of the um, QTL for the, the 50 traits when they're studied individually. In the right plot, I look at different ways of cutting the 50 traits into two, into, into two locations. So for each cut, this is a this compares the the two locus model to the best i mean the to the best of the possible two locus models um what this is saying is that i want to cut the traits into so that 11 of them are going over here and and or nine of them are over here and and 31 of them are, or 41 of them are over here um so if I think of a the best two locus model splits the traits into these all affected by the purple QTL on the left and these all affected by the pink QTL on the right. Um, and that, so the, um, so that locate this 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 example was the one that really looked when i looked at the qtl effects it looked really clear to be 
a bunch of genes, a, a bunch of genes expression was affected by a QTL over here, and a bunch of genes expression was affected by a QTL over here. This model, I mean, the, the sort of this explicit analysis kind of shows that split and gives kind of strength of evidence for there being two versus one locus. For the islet chromosome six locus, that's the one that I studied at the very beginning. Um, where I fine mapped it. So the the black curve again is the best single locus model and the, the blue kind of purplish and pink curves are for the best two locus models. Basically the best two locus model is to put um, one or two or one trait with one locus and all the other traits with the other one. Um, and it really doesn't look much better than the best, the two locus model and the, and the one locus model look about the same. So, you know, consistent with there really being a single locus, which is not a surprise for this particular case. Um, here's the, the chromosome two in islet. Um, again, the, the analysis shows um, the split of, you know, well, it shows if if the best two locus model has one locus a little to the left of 60 and the other locus, you know, at about 75, and the best locus, the, the best two locus model puts um, nine QTL, um, nine, nine traits affected by this left QTL and the rest of the traits affected by the right QTL. You can see how in the in this curve on the right sort of the evidence for where you decide to split of should you split here or should you split here basically is the question um that liver chromosome 17 again it's kind of the the best the best two locus model just pulls off one trait as being affected by a separate QTL from all the other ones, which is um, not super interesting. Uh, and it probably be better to, to drop that trait and study this again and say, if we look at all these other traits, do, we, do they all look to be affected by a common locus or not? Um, you can kind of see that out here of when I'm splitting the traits into groups, um, the strongest evidence is really to put one trait with one QTL and all the other traits with the other QTL. But when you get out here to around in the, in the midst of this again, there's some evidence for wanting to split these further. Um, th this adipose on chromosome 10 shows kind of the same, this formal analysis puts two of the traits affected by one QTL and all the other traits affected by the other QTL. And it's um, not really all that surprising given where, when studied individually, they end up mapping. But so in summary for today, so um, there's this effort to try to map genes that are affecting the expression of other genes. And one of the, the most interesting features of those, those efforts are these NZQTL hotspots, this, where a locus, a QTL, seems to affect expression of lots of different genes across the genome. In this particular experiment, we showed um, you know, there was this really large effect locus on chromosome six that it was very specific to pancreatic islets and looked to affect the expression of like 8% of the genes in the genome. Um, I had wanted to first try, you know, assuming that there's a single locus underneath one of these hotspots, can we find map it? And secondly, can we tell that it's a single locus and not more complicated, multiple? multiple DNA differences that are affecting the trait. Um, and my, 
to find map the, the hotspot, my main trick was to first focus on these non-recombinants, the, the mice that had constant genotype across the region. Use them to sort of create a classifier for um, relating genotype at that causal locus to the expression pattern. And then from that, I was able to basically turn the trait into something really simple. Instead of this, the expression pattern of lots of genes, turn it into something that's categorical. And that led me to be able to um, narrow in on this locus to, um, you know, a region with just three genes. And th this particular SLOCO 1A6 seems to be the one that's responsible. The second part I was looking at, um, how can we tell whether it's one locus or multiple loci? And I, I still use this technique of splitting recombinants and non-recombinants. In this case, um, linear discriminant analysis using the non-recombinants and then overlay the recombinants on top of that seemed to really um, seem to do a good job of showing the cases that were simple and the cases that were complicated. I think also the, the direction of the effect and the degree of dominance showed, at least in one case, um, evidence for a, a couple of um, loci. The formal statistical test um, was hard to implement and time consuming to calculate, but did provide some slightly more detailed information than these like um, strictly exploratory kind of visual means. Um, just should acknowledge that, I mean, this work, this case study that I'm describing is part of this huge project with a ton of people, including a, a former student in, in statistics, Janan Tian, who she did really um, half the thinking and all of the actual work on this. Um, if you if you want to look more at what um, kind of the details, it, the work was published in a, a couple of papers in genetics from a, a few years ago.